Before we get into this discussion, I'd like to start with a quote from Thomas Sowell. In politics, it doesn't matter what the facts are. What matters is what people believe. Much of politics is smoke and mirrors, theatrics, where public perception is the name of the game. I'll be using a clip from Jordan Peterson's conversation with Michael Malice as the basis for this analysis. So it's, it struck me over the last decade or so that the alignment of comedic satire with right-wing philosophy or, or political philosophy or views was something that was completely, also completely unprecedented. I, I thought, well, all of a sudden the right-wing are the jesters, or at least among the right wing are these jesters. And I really didn't know what to make of that. I mean, you seem to regard it in your book, The New Right, you, you seem to regard it as um, a, a kind of right wing anarchic rebellion against, but it's a strange, it's strange what they're against, because on the one hand, there's the corporate voice, let's say, that characterizes the media. And on the other hand, there's the left wing progressives. And you, you can't really put them in the same camp all that easily. Now, I'm actually going to disagree with most of that, starting with the difficulty of putting the corporate voice and the left-wing progressives in the same camp. I'm under the impression you can, but they'd be in different sections, so to speak. For one, both are globalistic entities, having no love or loyalty to the nation-state. They both despise the populist rhetoric that battles against the corporate machine, and it's manifested in this air of contempt for regular citizens of the land. It's done for different reasons, though. For one, technological advancement is granting the citizenry access to superior communication mechanisms. This emergence of competing voices to the mainstream consensus is undermining the authority of the corporate media apparatus. To the progressives, with their perceived higher plane of moral virtue, it's a competing ideology, one they regard with disgust. Constitutionalism versus progressivism, if you will. But ultimately, the progressives are the useful idiots, the famed KGB defector, Yuri Bezmanov, described the would-be disillusioned expendables as political prostitutes. Next up, the alignment of right-wing philosophy with comedic satire. Given his time in academia and the media, I'm a bit puzzled as to why he's surprised by this, seeing as he can note what the eye of the right-wing is aimed at, perhaps because he doesn't see the progressives and the corporate press as occupiers of the same camp. But then we're left with the question, why does he think they are both a target of the right wing? Political analysis might not be Dr. Peterson's forte, but I do know he has immense knowledge of the USSR and the Nazi regime. There's historical accounts after Lenin came to power of a clown duo named Bimbom who faced some trouble at the hands of the Chequers, the Bolshevik secret police, after engaging in an act of anti-Bolshevik satire. In Germany, Hitler would carefully scrutinize any photo of him that would be made public, lest it be seen as a figure of mockery or ridicule. In the present day, we have China's Xi Jinping banning Winnie the Pooh after he was memed with a cartoon bear, all of which makes a compelling case. Regardless of the political alignment presently wielding power, the jester is nevertheless seen as a threat to that power. Which leaves us with an interesting question. What is right wing? Let's do a short history lesson. The 1890s to the early 1900s was America's original progressive era, and its legacy is a lot uglier than most would care to realize. It would see the emergence of America's eugenics movement, and Democratic President Woodrow Wilson was a firm believer in this, as he oversaw the resegregation of much of the federal government, which he regarded as a benefit. Later decades would see the massive sweep of state intervention by Hoover and FDR throughout the Great Depression, as well as the Second World War. Smoot Holly Tarros, the New Deal, and the Wagner Act comes to mind. This is an important turning point in America's history, as the FDR years initiated the transfer of power away from political democracy and into the hands of the American university system, forming the structure that Mencius Molberg would refer to as the cathedral. FDR surrounded himself with a cabal of experts from the radical left-wing groups, many of which were unfamiliar to the public. It's been said that FDR surrounded himself with more of the intellectual elite than all previous presidents combined. Despite the reverence that history affords them, FDR and the New Deal were not only unsuccessful, they were abysmal failures, prolonging the Depression by seven miserable years. Director of the Bureau of the Budget, Lewis W. Douglas, resigned after only one year on the job, and in his private diary, 
FDR's own Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau, wrote the following. We have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. We have never made good on our promises. I say after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started, and an enormous debt to boot. He's not lying. After two terms of FDR, unemployment was in excess of 17%. His arrogance and delusions of grandeur paints FDR as a cliched progressive caricature, a man who considers himself indispensable and can save capitalism from itself. On the social end of things, October of 1919 would see the passing of the Volstead Act. Alcohol's prohibition would not only backfire spectacularly, causing a surge in organized crime thanks to the prominence of bootlegging, but the government would lose out on $11 billion in tax revenue and a further 300 million trying to enforce it. Furthermore, men like Wilhelm Reich would spawn fringe ideas about sexual liberation, bastardized concoctions of Marx and Freud in the 1920s, and his teachings would aid the counterculture that led to the free love movement of the 1960s. Accompanying this included lofty ideals of feminism, the decimation of moral habits, and dismantling of the family unit. Sexual repression was intertwined with economic exploitation, and sexual liberation would destroy the basis for capitalism. The late 60s would see the introduction of French intellectual thinking into the American university consciousness, as men like Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault would pioneer the postmodernist movement. Not on both economic and social grounds, progressivism regards capitalism as its ultimate nemesis. Around this time, particularly post-1930s, would see the distortion of classical political labels, as this era was the birthplace that would pave the way for a lot of progressive thought today, which would make the movement more than a century old. From the obscure corners of academia emanates this scourge of leftist thought that pervades much of Western society today. Technology has allowed its accelerated permeation into mass media, infecting many aspects of everyday life, from the political arena, entertainment, the corporate boardroom, even sport. Phrases like white privilege, intersectionalism, cultural diversity have become common speak, all of which are products of the progressive movement. One of the trickier aspects of navigating the political discourse of today's muddied environment is the use of political language under the assumption that their definitions remain constant, regardless of shifting political paradigms, which is obviously not the case. One must be very cautious of lefty shenanigans, appropriating pleasant-sounding labels for their own nefarious purposes, whilst they smear their opponents with words that already possess poor connotations. It's why you'll find hordes of screeching lemmings chanting fascist. Meanwhile, the right-wingers advocate for voting integrity, free speech, and the right to bear arms, all of which aren't exactly high on the list of priorities for a one-party dictatorship. I propose a more subtle solution. Instead of using political labels, Try using them as verbs. To liberate implies the removal of restrictions, of obstructions. To conserve implies protection. What is the trade-off of your liberation, and what is it then that you wish to conserve, and how? Naturally then, these phrases mean different things depending on the time period. Placed in America in the 1700s, being a conservative would grant you the label of a loyalist, siding with King George III, and keeping the Americas under the rule of the crown. To be a liberal would be siding with the patriots, being independent of the crown, overseeing the writing of the American Constitution, and thus the creation of the United States. I'm assuming Sarkhan would be in favor of the patriots. Then again, he is English, I wouldn't put it past him to be a loyalist just to piss off the French. Anyway, fast-forwarding to the 20th and 21st centuries, we're looking at a similar shifting political paradigm, but this time coming from the other direction, and an echoing warning of that incoming political shift would come from one of the greatest intellectuals of the last century, Milton Friedman. Conservatism might be Milton Friedman's legacy, but his writings reveal something different. In Capitalism and Freedom, he describes his viewpoints as liberalism, stating, The enemies of the system of private enterprise have thought it wise to appropriate its label. Liberalism, according to Milton Friedman, includes free speech, voluntary exchange, limited government, and decentralized power. This coincides perfectly with one of the last things he said to Peter Robinson of the Hoover Institution. The job of my generation was to mount a rigorous intellectual defense for human liberty. The job of your generation will be to keep your liberty. 
A prophetic warning, I'm sure you'd agree. As a left wing, I've become utterly deranged in their aspirations for utopian visions of society that is not only inconducive to reality, but would require a soul-crushing amount of tyranny. What the left want is antithetical to every civilized society in our species, under the implicit assumption that the inherent flaws of man can somehow be removed entirely through merciless social regulation. They are no longer liberal, as evidenced by the fact that pretty much everything they advocate for requires state intervention in some form or another. They would gleefully sacrifice meritocracy and capitalism, all the while chasing a perfectionist ideal in the name of equality, and what they wish to liberate. Well, let's just say it raises eyebrows and alarming calls for the woodchipper. Heeding the words of Milton Friedman, and now noting the left shifting away from classical liberal values over the course of a century, makes the right-wing gesture not only unsurprising, but inevitable. Friedman's lasting legacy leaves the impression that his job was complete. His generation was some of the last liberators. They fought for the spoils of victory, and won. If, like Sargon, you are a true believer in the values of classical liberalism, this will make becoming a conservative a necessary inevitability in the current political climate, because he has recognized the ideas and work that have been handed down to us by the liberators of our past have produced unimaginable prosperity and good moral outcomes. Values like private enterprise, free speech, equality of opportunity, and individualism. These have produced a truly liberal society, one where the citizenry are free to conduct themselves with a sense of quiet dignity. And these are things that are worthy of conservation, not only for ourselves but for our future kin. The modern-day conservative has thus become the ideological heir of the classical liberal. The battle lines have been drawn. It was the task of our forebears to liberate the spoils of victory. And it will be the task in our time to conserve it.